So, Abby, I was so touched and thrilled when you sent me a message recently on Instagram talking about kind of how talking about your your diagnosis journey, but also a return for you to a music career that you had taken a hiatus from. And I was just so touched. And then you sent me a link to your song, which I w was a little hesitant to listen to because I thought, oh, no, what if it's terrible? <laughs> <laughs> and it was so, and it was so good do you remember my response i was like holy shit uh it was such a good song and i just immediately pounced on you and i was like oh my i have to hear your story so thank you for oh, joining me that's so <laughs> lovely um, thank you so yeah so why don't you kind of talk me through how long ago you were diagnosed or what was happening in your life that you really started to put these pieces together and think this this could be adhd well i tell you now i'm like how did i never how did anyone never even <laughs> suggest anything it's mind-blowing but i I'd had a friend that was diagnosed seven years ago and I didn't really know anything about it, you know, and she would talk about her problems and I'd go, yeah, but that's normal. I've got, I'm like, I'm a bit similar, but because I, you know, bless her, she's a little bit of a hot mess <laughs> and I was often helping her. I just assumed that I it didn't, it wasn't me at all, um, but it wasn't until another one of my side businesses had many, many of them to support my music because music's hard for everyone, well, most people. Um, and it was this year I was I had meetings with marketing people, bookkeepers. I would sit with them. I would know what they'd want me to do. Then I'd come home and I would just be frozen. And I felt like I was going absolutely crazy. Um, and then it dawned on me, oh, I think this is what people are referring to as maybe ADHD. And as soon as I had that thought, it, my, it was like the rug from my whole life just pulled out from under me. And I found your podcast. And when you mentioned that book by Sari Solden, The Women with ADHD, I got the audio book. I listened to it twice and I just I was absorbing all the information I could and was just completely broken apart, absolutely, like my whole life. Um, and I think because I'm an emotional Piscean and a musician, that had a very turbulent childhood. I just put it all down to that. And then um, when I realized I needed to get diagnosed and the waiting list, some of them weren't even taking anyone. Um, the, waiting, the first waiting list I had to wait till March next year. And I just felt like my whole life was at stake, relationship, business, sanity, everything. So I kept going to the doctor and getting more referrals. And I went on a, a cancellation list with a lady that specializes in um, ADHD with children. And of course, with children, they cancel a lot. So I got in very quickly. It was within maybe six weeks. And in that first meeting, I had found a, a book online um, a pre-diagnosis thing and I did all of it which I hate paperwork <laughs> but I did the whole thing and just handed it to her and within that first session she said yeah okay let's let's try some medication and see what happens and it was night and day <laughs> um, the, I think for me the biggest thing was in that Sari Solden book when they talk about hiding, that's where I realized in my entire music career, I've had very stark chapters of hiding and um, that rejection sensitive dysphoria plays a big role in my life. 
And um, as soon as I got the diagnosis within that first week, I went, that's it. This single I've been sitting on for a couple of years has to come out. I have to do it. And then I realized that the song sounds like an ADHD song because it's about going underground <laughs> till you can shine. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Oh, absolutely um, right. I feel like the file that under the signs were there all along. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, here I am and, and my other side business, which as well um, has a similar story. Like I, I was basically, uh, when I first moved to the paradise of Byron Bay, I was needing money fast. And I cooked up this idea of um, doing very fancy, posh cleaning for the stars. And in order to get me through that, which was a, at the time, it was a really, um, you know, I'd just come from being on The Voice and I was in a movie in Mexico and I'd done all this stuff and then I was cleaning. So I started making products that made me want to clean. And I was putting crystals in them and they were plant-based. And um, so then, you know, I, that creativity came out and I started this business called Abby's Alchemy. And so now I have this dopamine-filled cleaning business, <laughs> which is hilarious. So, um, yeah. Did I answer your question? Am I rambling? Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's, you know, it's funny to me. I, that's actually really clever going with, um, you know, looking up clinics that work with children because of the cancellation. I think that's really brilliant. I'm like, hopefully somebody out there can take a chapter know, of that book. <laughs> right? Do it. Be right? Yeah. Because I feel like that's also one of the agonizing things about seeking this diagnosis is the wait list that's happening right now to so many of us, right? And that feeling of like this, we have such a sense of urgency around the validation we need for the with the diagnosis and how it feels yeah. physically painful to have to wait. <laughs> and it's like that in itself is the diagnosis. Like if it feels physically painful for you to have to not immediately have this, you know, this, this revelation validated in some way. I'm like, yeah, I think it, you're on the right track. <laughs> yeah. I, I did at first wonder, should I get diagnosed? What difference does it make? And that's what little I knew about it at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but I really think that it, it's invaluable to find out. <laughs> the compassion that it allows you um, is, is everything and my partner um I think at first he he was like no you're not because his idea of it was pretty limited but then we both started to notice all the things that I do that annoy him <laughs> <laughs> are pretty much that like talking a lot info dumping in the morning upon waking uh -huh. yeah <laughs> and uh <laughs> Trying not to talk when we're watching a film. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I'm cleaning my house, it's a bit different. I get distracted. So there's usually 10 different things happening at once. <laughs> Interesting, right? It is so much yeah. easier to clean somebody else's space than our own, oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, uh, now, you had mentioned that you had a tumultuous childhood. And I think I saw somewhere, maybe it was one of your Instagram posts, you had talked about growing up, spending some years in Singapore, right? So what was yes. what was your childhood like? And what were some of the things when you were having, putting these, connecting these dots where you looked back over your life and thought, oh my goodness, it was ADHD all along? Well, I think that you know, like I had um, my parents separated when I was young, which to me was fine. I just had suddenly had two homes. Um, and but it, it got tricky when the parents were not getting on. Um, and my mum and stepfather moved to Singapore and um, there were three years there and then three years in England. And then when I was 12, 
um, I chose to leave my mother because I didn't feel safe with my stepfather. So, but then my dad's fourth, I'm pretty sure my dad was ADHD. He married five <laughs> times. So um, his, my dad's then wife decided she didn't want to be a stepmother. So then I went and lived with guardians. So that rejection sensitive dysphoria when you're young um, I think I just put it all down to what happened to me as a kid. Um, but, you know, I think the RSD, um, it makes sense of why I um, have reacted to friendship breakdowns. They just devastate me um, cripplingly. And even when I went on The Voice... <laughs> I knew it was a TV show and there was every chance I'd, you know, get kicked off, but it still devastated me. Um, and it was just not logical. Um, and then I started learning piano about a year and a half ago and my teacher, in her very traditional French way, got kind of firm with me, and which is fine for most people, but I left like a toddler in tears and never played piano again. And I, I, I like look back at that and I go, that is rejection sensitive dysphoria, totally, because I wanted to be perfect and right and do this song that I was obsessed with. And she wanted me to go from a certain section of the song and my brain wouldn't allow me to do that. I had to do it from the top and go through and so it was I look back at that and go my brain was working differently and I needed more encouragement um and I do love the piano and I want to pick it back up again um but I might need to find a more playful teacher or something <laughs> right yeah. yeah yeah you know I, I do feel like all of us remember exactly where we were the first time we ever heard the term rejection sensitive dysphoria. And we were like, what's that? Let me Google that. And then that feeling of like, oh my goodness, this, yeah. this explains so much. And, um, you know, it was interesting because I feel like talking about the, the concept of hiding in the uh, Sari Solda Michelle Frank workbook, it's what was so interesting to me when I first listened to that book. And I had the same reaction. I listened to it and was like, this is incredible. And then I went out and bought the book just to own it <laughs> and, um, and have read it several times at this point. But it's like the thing that really amazed me about the, the concept of hiding was that I understood that, you know, we masked a lot and that there were many times where I may have tried to put on this public front about who I really was. And I understood that concept of masking. But when I read the book, it was the first time I realized how much I was, I had pulled away from things because yeah. I felt rejection sensitivity and that I, in you know, that there were people who may have pulled away from me because I was too much or it wasn't, you know, it was a little, it didn't work, but I was actively pulling away from a lot of things in my life, you know, to protect, to protect I think we pull away from things to protect ourselves emotionally from that RSD. It's like we've been burned. We know how yes. hard it is to feel and process those emotions. So we're like, I can't go there anymore. Right. And I, and I feel like that's so tragic in so many of the ways that we do kind of pull away from things that are important to us. Um, yes. Right. And, and then go ahead. Sorry, I was, I was going to say, it's made me think about my father in a different way. Um, because he wasn't um, really very present and, um, you know, he, w he wasn't a great father. But when he died, I was very fortunate to be by his bed. I flew in and I was there and, you know, he was basically kind of, he wasn't conscious, but um, I had the fortunate position of singing him over the line and um, I feel that it neatly tied everything up that experience where there was just so much love that it healed that whole life of 
not of feeling rejected by him and um i you know i i think now he i'm quite certain that he did have adhd or something like that um and I don't know where I'm going with this point, but um... <laughs> well, I think it's like I, I feel like I've heard from other guests who have talked about, you know, how recognizing some of the struggles that, re, you know, our parents or grandparents might have had as a result of having undiagnosed ADHD, feeling like a failure, feeling lost, feeling yes. like you're broken and being able to feel feel like you have a little more empathy for them in the way that they may have treated you, realizing kind of where that's coming from. It sounds like that's what you were saying, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what are your thoughts on Gabor Mate's um, approach? nature versus nurture. I I mean, I think there's a lot of things I align with in terms of, you know, I'm always questioning on this podcast, what even are we talking about? What is ADHD? And, and one of the things I really like about Gabor Mate's approach is that he looks at the brain as having a sort of you know, that the ADHD has been facilitated by some form of trauma or, or some kind of, um, some kind of uh, like malleability of our neural pathways. Right. And so this idea that like, you know, we're not necessarily born with ADHD. The ADHD is what comes from the way in which our brain is reacting to things that have happened to us in our life. And maybe there's certain types of brains genetically that, you know, why, you know, I, I had another guest call it sensitive wiring, right? I really like that term. Yeah. Just, you know, this idea of like there's neurodivergence, which is how I kind of think of certain people who are born with certain brains. And then those brains react to experience experiences in a way that might then facilitate ADHD in the form of, you know, distractedness or, or disorganization or poor memory or a lot of the those behaviors that overlap with some of the other also trauma induced mood disorders like OCD or PTSD and yeah. So I really like the way of that thinking. And I think that was really important and really revelatory when he started writing about that. But I also like when I read Scattered Minds, I had to stop halfway through. I've never finished that book because I found oh. it really misogynistic. <laughs> I oh, found right. it really I haven't read as, it. it's I oh, just there's so much about trauma and the relationship with the mother that I felt very uncomfortable with as a woman and as a mother, where I was like, what it, how right. is this benefiting us to put so much blame on on the bonds and the relationship with mothers when mothers often are so you know are in such a state of struggle and overwhelm to begin with i was like how is this benefiting anybody to be like at the end of the day it was all mom's fault and i realized that's oversimplifying it and i'm sure he would disagree with me but i that was, that's kind of why wow. I never recommend that book <laughs> because wow, I feel I've like not read it. <laughs> oh, really? I've, um, no, well, not I, that one. I've, yeah. Well, and he's one of the only psychologists that really will touch trauma with a 10 foot pole. And I feel like because it's such a complicated issue, I got to give him props for really delving into that in a, in a really curious way. And so um, I think, you know, I think there's a lot of merit to a lot of the stuff he writes, but something about the whole relationship with the mother thing just rubs me the wrong way. I don't know. It's just feels very un uh, just, yeah. Anyway, one sided. <laughs> well, it just feels very masculine, right? Uh, in, in terms of the, in terms of the, like, yep, we figured it all out. It's all comes down to the mom, and I'm like, oh, really? Uh, it's very funny. Wow. So, <laughs> but yeah, that's my that's my take on scattered minds in a nutshell. But I, I do think there's a lot about, in, you know, in terms of just, you know, I think there's so many questions around, like, why why now right i think that's the other the other question i have which is like why in the few the last few years have so many of us been diagnosed is it just increased awareness over what to look for and what this looks like and we're all just kind of collectively coming to understand that adhd might have many more faces than we thought it used to or did we just experience 
a, a form of collective trauma because of lockdown, because of the pandemic, or politically, we're going through a lot of trauma. Culturally, we're going through a lot of trauma in the last few years. So it's like, yeah. you know, is that what's happening to us? Are we having trauma-like responses that mimic ADHD because so many of us are going through a lot <laughs> <laughs> right now. And I'm, I don't know. I mean, how do you even begin to unpack that? I don't know. I feel like I've been doing that for the since my diagnosis, like trying to really figure out what's happening here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe the thing is, it, it's not about finding an answer. It's just having the question and seeking. Well, yeah, right. And I think that's what can be so profound about this diagnosis is that we're shifting away from that thinking of what's wrong with me. I'm the problem. I'm terrible. I can't do what everybody else is doing. All of those ways in which we had sort of dumped on ourselves as being the problem and a diagnosis of ADHD and why it feels so liberating and not at all pathological to so many of us is because it's really an explanation yes. and saying like, oh, okay, this explains a lot. I was not the problem. This is an issue of emotional reg dysregulation or dopamine deficiency or whatever, you know, whatever is the answer to each of our many my myriad issues. I, I <laughs> um, mean, one right? thing, sorry, I was butting in. No, um, it's great. I just think that in a way, it feels like now I know why I feel like I'm blessed with this curse of having to, um, always feeling driven to do the thing I'm born to do, um, always wanting to do my music or my art. And um, I feel that for people with ADHD, it's, it's heightened. Like we, we have to do, live into our callings or we will suffer if we don't. It's like the volume of that was just ramped right up to 11. Right. That's how I uh, feel. Yeah. I know. And, <laughs> and ever since I heard the term hyper arousal, I feel like I want to use it all the time instead of hyperactivity. I've not because heard that. So I just recently, when, so a few months ago when I went to the ADHD conference in uh, the annual ADHD conference, William Dodson, who is an amazing psychologist writer, he was giving a lecture where he talked about, uh, instead of using the term hyperactivity, he prefers the term hyper arousal. And I just, right, I just, my jaw dropped because I just felt like that so perfectly encapsulates what you're talking, what you're explaining, right? Like, I don't think many of us really relate to hyperactivity. Maybe you're like, oh yeah, I guess I fidget a little or I don't know, I twirl my hair. Like there's things, I talk fast. Like there's things where we recognize hyperactivity in ourselves, but hyper arousal just feels like that emotional response we get. Or like you're saying, like everything yeah. feels like it's turned to 11. <laughs> it's such, yeah. Right. And, and I think, you know, it's an, so that I definitely relate to so much more in terms of, you know, what I've often called the too muchness of life, where it's like we can go from zero to 150 in terms of emotional response and emotional dysregulation and just feeling like, or, or like you said, like, how do you even describe to people how a certain emotional, you know, a certain response to something can feel physically painful, right? And, and w where people kind of give you this look like, all right, take it down a notch. But, <laughs> and then you feel like you're, well, you're like, oh, what's wrong with me that I'm, I'm feeling so overwhelmed in this moment. Yeah. So. You just made me remember that as a little kid, I was always told that I was a bit too much because I was mm. so emotional. Like uh, my grandmother said I was sunshine and rain when I was really little because I would really, really feel something and like be crying and then the next minute I'd be laughing. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's at 11. <laughs> right? Well, and I think it's an yeah. interesting paradox that we have, which is like, on the one hand, we have this childlike enthusiasm about going for something that we're interested in, right? It's like we feel compelled to follow a trail, an interest, a new, you know, when we're, we have so much of that like driven energy and, and that flow when it's, when everything is flowing wonderfully, it's just, it's magic. But at the same time, it's like the flip side of that is the hiding, the turning our back, the pulling away from something because it feels too much and we want to protect our 
hearts, right? It's like you yeah. have to protect you, the fragility of your mental health sometimes in a way that, that we have to pull away from things we love. And yeah. I was just reminded of that when you were kind of, when you had written to me about, about, you know, have leaving singing and leaving a career that was so important to you. But at the same time, like I just felt it in your words about how, um, the, when this, I don't know, is it like the stakes are high or, you know, sometimes a passion can feel like it's too much. Right. Yeah. And I think also when you have societal pressures of like, like for me turning 40, I was like, Oh, well that's it. You know, I didn't make it. I, mm. Well, other people would go, oh, wow, like she's starring in a movie. There was a, there was a doco made about me in Mexico that, that travelled the film festival and it looked on paper like I'd made it, but then I was coming back to Australia and then working as a cleaner. And so I was like, oh, well, you know, that's it. I've, you know, I've had my time. But um, mm. I, I, um, one thing I really want to add is I did, I had had the book, Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, for 20 years. And then I finally was ready for it in that complete desperation black hole. I dedicated myself to it. I did my morning pages every morning for 12 weeks. I did The Artist Date once a week, which is you spend half an hour just doing something for fun. Whatever it is, visiting an art shop, doing something new, just playing. Um, and it flicked a switch. I've done my morning pages ever since. And when I got my diagnosis, I started doing the artist way again. Um, and I think it's great, for, particularly for people with ADHD, because you have to play um, and make time, half an hour a week, to do something to fill your cup and I think there's something in that it, writing every morning when your subconscious is still um, active you're more in touch with getting answers and guidance and it can really help take all of the rubbish out of your head and um, I think that that's a tool that I won't, will never give up <laughs> Yeah. I love that. That's a very ADHD thing to say to getting all the rubbish out of your head. Yeah. <laughs> but it it's really true, is. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's... If I miss a day or two, it's it's okay. I don't beat myself up. But I I, I feel like, well, I need to dump and I know, dump in the pages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really like the idea of scheduling in sort of guilt-free downtime because I think that can be really difficult for many of us. For myself, I, I now schedule non-working time because I find it very difficult for to to have that boundary if I'm just like lying around you know if I'm if I have downtime I usually feel guilty over the fact that I'm not doing something productive and and but I also realize that downtime is productive in just different ways right and so I have to like be very intentional about it I just discovered something which might seem crazy because I'm 47 but I've just realized that trying to do tax book work anything that i find challenging the week before my period is just crazy it will lead to total burnout meltdown because um, that's what i've been trying to do <laughs> <laughs> i'm like no i need to like lock that in the diary and go this week is not that <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think, um, it's, I, I'm so terrible at keeping track of that just also cause I'm also about to turn 48 and I'm like, my, my period is not regular by any means anymore. And so it's really right. difficult for me to like get that cycle. But I think, you know, it's one of the things that realizing how much hormones play into our ADHD and our executive functioning as women is such a revelation, right? Which is like, oh, that explains a lot, right? <laughs> but at the same time, keeping track of it is not something we're terribly good at. So <laughs> no, uh, right. 
Uh, but it is. But I think that that's such an important way of managing. You know, when we talk about managing ADHD, it's really about paying attention in those ways where it's like, how can I set myself up for success in these ways where I'm like, this is not the week to do that. Right. Yeah. And really mm. trying to understand that there's like, there are cycles to when it might be a great time to do that or when it might be a better time to, you know, write emails or when there's, you know, trying to really think of like, where is, where is my cyclical energy? That's been really huge for me too. Yeah. I call it biorhythms where I'm like, what are my biorhythms throughout the day and throughout the month and even throughout the year, right? Pulling back and being like, what, what are the seasons that I'm most likely to do things in? Yeah. Yeah. Now, now you've got me thinking I need to actually map it out for the year in the diary and just like, <laughs> right. Okay, in yeah. next year's diary, I'm just gonna, <laughs> <laughs> I have two. I have the Google Calendar and the paper one because I don't trust myself. Oh, I do too. Plus, I just like to write it over and over again. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. So that's, you know, makes me think, like, what else do you feel like, what has changed for you since your diagnosis? I mean, we've talked Ooh. a little bit about going back to music and... Yeah. Um, yeah. M music is my, I feel like, is the reason I'm alive. I have, oh. it, it comes to me, it feels, well, easy and one of the hardest things as well because you've always got to face yourself. You've always got to go to battle in a way. Um, but it's, um, I think it's what I'm here to do and I still um, face resistance. You know, you still, when you go to write a song, it's like, you want it to be the best every time. But you ha um, I've had to learn how to just play and do little bits as a habit. Um, and I joined an online songwriting club, which you just have to write a song in an hour. They throw a word up and you just have to make noise and put things out there, which is a really good practice because you just have to do something, anything. And it, uh, it does help you to let go and just make whatever and, and have less attachment. Um, so I think doing what you love at whatever capacity, if you have no money, um, it, it, that doesn't have to get in the way of the thing that you love. Like if you want to be an artist, I firmly believe anything you want to do, you just, do it like if you have a pen you can draw in on a napkin um it can be anything and then over time it will just blossom that's my advice did i go off tangent there <laughs> oh totally i loved it but you know it was i love the um the the music group because it's so perfectly like it's like you've got you you've got an urgent deadline which helps you can overcome perfectionism right yeah. <laughs> and the overthinking i think that's so perfect for our brains right that just like nope it don't is. even think about it and why we love you know why we love that spinning plate deadline feeling right which is like oh i get i get past myself i, I get out of my own way and then you're just like i just have to throw something together yeah yeah and there's accountability and you've got a group a small group of people and you have to listen to everyone's stuff and it teaches you even if you listen to something that you really don't like you learn how to provide feedback and just comment on the things that stood out to you um mm. and and you learn so much in that process as well um, so it's, it's a really cool thing to find a group like that. Um, so yeah. <laughs> do you, do you find you approach you, your own approach to writing music or performing is different now? Um, well, this new song is really, um, it's, it's a new thing for me and I've called it electro twang because I've, you know, I play banjo, guitar, ukulele, harmonica. It's always been very rootsy, Americana, singer, songwriter stuff. Apart from when I randomly flew to Mexico and started making music there, which was like 
Mexican surf, rock and roll, and I sang in Spanish. <laughs> um, and I did have a 10-piece Mexican band in Melbourne for a while. But um, apart from that, this new music is just so exciting because I started in my just experimenting in this club. I started adding electronic stuff and samples, but then bringing in the pedal steel or the banjo. So for me, um, it's like this whole new world has opened up where it's like modern and old. And my partner, Matthew, um, writes techno music. So he could hear what I was playing with on my garage band, but he has the skills um, to actually make it magical. So he took my ideas and then made this single so it's really nice now that um we have something that we can do together sometimes so yeah it's great <laughs> that is great and does it does it sounds playful right which is what you were saying it's yes yes more... and you know i know i just know in my heart that i'm i'm most at home on stage for some strange reason um i've always felt whole more completely me on stage for some reason I do not really understand why but um, I know that I'm supposed to be doing that and um, and I'm happy I have a few more singles up my sleeve that will come out over the next few months and I have big visions of um, performing but um, I'm also sort of enjoying having a side business to support that at the moment um, with my dopamine cleaning stuff. <laughs> Abby's alchemy. So, yeah, yeah. That's it's wonderful. nice to um, not have all the pressure on music. I think when when it was all about being on social media and having to make a living, you know, I used to live in my van and tour around and travel all the time and I think that your RSD can flare up a lot when you're, for me, the pressure of having to make a living, it all becomes, because it's you, you're the brand, it eats at your self-worth when you're like, oh, well, I'm not, you know, I'm struggling. But I have another thing that I have this sort of a spiritual um, creative outlet through my alchemy, making all these wonderful things in my lab. And it's just another expression of my creativity. And somehow it all works. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I feel like that was for me, I had this long list of short-lived businesses. I'm not going to call them failed businesses, <laughs> but they were like short-lived. But I also feel like now I've I look at them as all each one of them as being a building block, right? Like of this patchwork yes. quilt of, of who I am now. Yeah. <laughs> totally. I was a hypnotherapist. <laughs> and like when I, I, I did that for a while in Melbourne and I realized, Oh, it's like when you're doing hypnotherapy on someone, it was, it was so similar to writing a song because you've got to think on your feet while they're under hypnosis. You don't know what they're going to say, so you have to think in metaphors. And I was like, this is like songwriting. Um, but in the end, it was my executive dysfunction that um, I, I just sort of turned me off because you have to do so much marketing and to find clients and do all of that. So that, um, you know, I look back now and go, my whole, all of my careers, even my music career, it was always that stuff that I struggled with. Um, and even now I am getting some help to look at all of the stuff I find really, really hard with Abby's Alchemy, just like the bookkeeping and the marketing and all of that stuff. I like elements of it, but planning for me is not my strong suit. Right. So. Yeah, yeah, and it kind of amazes me that, like, why would I ever think I was supposed to be good at all the things? Like, why, you know, I've always, that always makes, you know, now I'm kind of in this 
framework of like, who can I offload this to? I, I can't do this. I don't want to do it. Who can I get to do this is much more my mindset now, as opposed to like, why did we always default to this place of shame? And like, I should be able to do my taxes. Like, why would you be able to do your taxes if you, that's not what you're cut out for, you know, like, I just sort of feel like, why did we always put so much pressure on ourselves to do all of the things by ourselves? Yeah, asking for help. That's amazing. right. Yeah. It's huge. I like it. Even yesterday I was carrying um, heaps of stuff and someone said, oh, do you want a hand? And I physically, I almost short circuited. I wanted to say <laughs> yes, but I was like, and, and, and it got really awkward. <laughs> and then I said, Yeah, okay. Like, and we all laughed about it. Because it's just, why can't we just say yes? I get, because when you do say yes, you're allowing their energy, their giving. Like, people receive from energy from giving. So, we're cutting off the flow where we don't do it. We have to, have to be able to say yes, please, thank you. Right. That's such a good I'm perspective. I'm saying this to myself. I know. I know. It is a good reminder yeah. that actually people like to help <laughs> and yeah. that we are helping them by allowing them to help us. It's it's reciprocal. Yeah. Right? And also I, w I thought about when you were talking about being on stage and how comfortable it is to be on stage, because I do think that's something that some of, uh, many of us have that that question, like, am I an introvert? Am I an extrovert? Because I feel like an introvert a lot of the time, but I love being oh. performing. I love being on stage. I have a performative element, right? I love, you know, public speaking or being on stage. And I wonder, you mentioned as a child being, you know, accused of being too much. And on stage, you have permission to be as much as you want, right? And I, so I wonder if there's something there, if there's a connection there in terms of the, the permission yeah. when you're on when you're on stage to be as much so, as you want. <laughs> I feel that I am inherently an introvert because I recharge through being alone, and I love my space and my alone time. But when I'm on stage, and it's going to sound a bit woo woo. <laughs> But I have always, and even before I knew about woo woo stuff, I would, before I went on stage, I had this conversation. It was like I, I was connecting with my guides and being on stage was all, always felt that it was um, about allowing people the more comfortable and the more joy I had on stage, it gave everyone in the room permission to feel it. And so it, if I was nervous, there was one time where I was on live television playing a song I didn't know. And I was really nervous. <laughs> and I had to just say to myself, get out of the way, because it's not about me. It's about it's about everyone else and I just have to sort of let let everyone else come through me and take over. So I think maybe it's it, it's a bit more of a spiritual thing, I don't know, being on stage. And then, yeah, then I love being at home and making stuff and being in my garden and, yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. And I feel like I am I often don't think I'm very woo, but I am a huge proponent of like energy in that way. I feel like there's yeah. so much energy between humans and in rooms, you know? And so we, we often talk about like walking into a room and feeling the vibe, right? Feeling energy in rooms from different people and, you know, never knowing if it's going to be like, Hey, I'm going to have the greatest time. Or you walk into a room and you're like, Oh, nope, I need to leave. <laughs> this is not the vibe for me. And, and yeah. I think, right. Like I, I love that idea that we, create a sense of energy between us yeah maybe adhd people just have that heightened do you think so right well everything else is turned up i wouldn't be surprised if we feel that frequency <laughs> and and feel things without logically knowing like you can you know know if you can trust someone without even really having only met them mm. no like sometimes i meet people 
and straight away I know that it's safe to talk about all the weird, crazy stuff. <laughs> and I just know. I just know. <laughs> it's great. Right. Yeah. I definitely feel like those are the, those are our ADHD sisters. Cause it's like, you know, I know I've, and I have always had always been like that where I was like, I don't have time for small talk. I'm like, can we please no. like get immediately to the trauma or like, let's get immediately to like the weird, you know, theories about science or something like where I'm like, uh, you know, let's, <laughs> can we make a t-shirt that says allergic to small talk? Oh, I like, like an, that. An allergy bracelet that we all wear. <laughs> there you go. You've just created another small, another side business. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to write that down. T-shirt business. <laughs> <laughs> That's Accident- the other Oops. I know, right? Oops. I accidentally started another business. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Um, one great thing. Um, this guy told me this two years ago and, and I'm, I'm doing it. You get a little book. And you write on an ideas car park Mm. and you put all of your ideas into the book. So it helps get everything out. Um, You know, I just saw a TikTok video recently and I want to reach out to this woman because it's one of the most brilliant, brilliantly simple methods I've seen to this idea of the brain dump or like, you know, taking, just clearing out all of the rubbish and putting it somewhere. Cause I often talk about that with my clients too. It's like, how can I park this somewhere? So it takes up less bandwidth in my brain, but I don't lose it forever. Right. Because I think we have that idea of like, I need to hold on to these things because if I don't, if I don't act on it immediately, or if I don't tend to it, it's going to be lost in the ether. Yeah. And so, the, so this woman had, she basically just had like a, um, sticky notes, like um, post-it notes, and she just writes everything from, you know, make a dentist appointment to, you know, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, radically transform the environmental policies in my neighborhood or something. Like it was just like everything from crazy outlandish ideas to chores that needed to be tended to. And she just writes it all down. And then she just has paper after paper after paper where she just puts the sticky notes like in a grid um, on the papers and she just flips through them and then looks for like, what are three ones that I can do right now? What are three I can do today? And she just does, it's sort of this variation of the pick three uh, model that I had heard about, I've heard about before, which is very successful for a lot of people, which is like, don't have an overwhelming to-do list. Just pick three things. And that never worked for me because I just, there's, I have, I, I can't just pick three. I don't know. It's never worked for me, but, but there was something very appealing about this idea yeah, of yeah, just yeah. having endless <laughs> sticky notes and going through them and just being like, okay, which, what am I doing today? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I well, liked it. It was very visually appealing. The, with the morning pages, um, Julia Cameron says like once you get to the end of the book, you get two different colored highlighters. So one color you highlight, um, you know, ideas that stand out and then the other color are actions to do. So at the end of it, you can go through and, um, see what it is that your heart really, really wants. So that's a cool concept. But for me, I actually find it um, pretty challenging to read over the old stuff. Right. I just want to, I just want to burn them, which, which, which (laughs) people do too. Just like let, let it go. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) I can't imagine going back and reading my journals from university. That would be torture to me. (laughs) No, I, I burnt all of mine from my childhood. Did you really? That's bold. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll do that one on a New Year's Eve. It was <laughs> really, really, set fire to them really, all. really cathartic. Yeah. And um, there's another uh, ritual that I think could be really nice for ADHD people. It's a Peruvian ritual um, called a despacho ceremony. And you traditionally get white tissue paper, but instead of making a New Year's you know, a wish list of all the things that you want to do. It's completely opposite. You basically get all like food and flowers and um, organic things and you make a, um, like a visual mandala, but every item you put on this tissue paper while you're building this beautiful piece of 
food art or whatever you're using um, is you're saying thank you for the things in your life. Um, and I did this one New Year's Eve where I was alone and feeling sorry for myself. But um, I discovered the superpower of gratitude that night because I did it for about three hours and I was writing on leaves um, and saying thank you for all of everything in my life. And I was buzzing for a good two weeks after that. Um, and then on the January the 1st, you wrap it up and you bury it in the ground, like you're giving it back to the earth. And it, it was totally magical. And I've done it every New Year's ever since. And I, I wrote friends in. Wow. Um, and even guys that come round to parties, I'm like, we're doing a dispatcher ceremony. And I thought they'd be like, nah, but they're totally into it. They're like, oh, you got to dig a big hole, get it in the ground. And <laughs> so I think that, um, you know, I've heard people say, oh, gratitude, you know, the superpower. But um, physically doing something like that is really, really powerful. Yeah. Wow. That sounds amazing. I don't think I've ever heard of it, but I'm a big fan of, of ritual, especially New Year and solstice rituals too. So I'm like, yeah. oh, I'm going to look into that. Um that's so cool. It's, it's just so different from going, oh, you know, like I want this and I don't have that. Like you're thinking from with New Year's resolutions often of what you don't have. Um, and it's it's um, a totally different space, of a heart space to just be like, wow, I'm, I'm so grateful for it. There's a lot to be grateful for. When you start doing it, it sort of snowballs. You might start at first going whatever <laughs> but but it does actually work yeah yeah and I, I I've talked about this this theme I think kind of is woven throughout on the podcast this idea that it is literally more interesting for us to focus on the negative it's there's more dopamine in focusing on what we don't have there's the puzzle that's the puzzle we love to solve the problem where can I you know how can I improve how can I fix things and so we tend to spend very little mental energy on what's working <laughs> and then it's like yeah. surprise why are we all so depressed and so it's like uh you know that idea of like yes take it really build Building that muscle to reframe a lot of the time has been, and I, you know why I think people like Sari sold in their work is so important is because they spend so much time rather than saying you have ADHD, we're going to fix everything. She says, no, nothing was ever wrong with you. Let's reframe some of the things that are yeah. wonderful in your life. And let's really have, you know, ex show, let's work on having gratitude for the amazing human you already are. And I think that's so much more profound found and powerful than saying like, all right, let's figure out how we're going to find the right skip perfect planner for you and how we're going to fix everything. And it's like, no, 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 you never need it to be fixed. She says, I think she says dogs and furniture are the only things that need to be fixed. <laughs> right? Oh my God. You know, you've just given me another business idea. I'm going to do a hypnotherapy with music, with, with all that positive stuff. ADHD is. There we are. Right. I love it. Yes, absolutely. Sign me up. Uh, now, I now I always love to ask if you could rename ADHD, would you call it something else? Okay. Well, um, I noticed a young man wrote um, the other week, he called it Dave. Have uh -huh. you heard of that? Oh, yeah. I've heard of that. Connor DeWolf. Yep. Dopamine, attention, variability, executive dysfunction. <laughs> but I, when I was trying to think about it, I, the closest thing I got, and I know it's not on point, but what came to my mind was intention overdrive. As in your, and it has different meanings in it too, because your true intentions will overdrive everything. So um, that was the closest I got because I felt like, you know, it heightens our need to follow our calling. Yeah. Um, it's not, I know it's not the one yet, but. <laughs> I like it. Or we could also just call it like turned, turned up to 11. 
Yeah. Do, you know, it's dials 11. on 11. We'll just call it 11. 11? Oh, I like that. Very simple. It's great. I can see hey, the merch, good. right? I can see the merch already. Just the di- the music dial and uh, like the amp and then just yeah, have it say 11. Yeah, and the name of that girl in that series. Oh, 11. yeah. Uh, from Stranger cool. Things, right? It's like, if you know, you know. 11. Yeah. <laughs> She's she has ADHD too. for sure. She's right? totally got ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. 11. I love that it. Can be on the t-shirt too. Perfect. But, oh yeah. my goodness. Well, I was yeah. so pleased that you reached out to me. I was so touched. And I'm just so in awe of your talent and your perspective. So I'm so oh, grateful that you reached you. out to me and that we were thank able to you. have this conversation. And this is my coming out. Like I haven't told people publicly. So, um, but I figured that, you know, like someone said to me, don't tell anyone you'll get judged. And then I thought I got a bit fearful. And then I thought, but, but, wouldn't I be missing out on connecting with my people? Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I think I know it's funny because when I kind of came out and I came out accidentally because I had this platform and, and I sort of, you know, was sort of like, oh, yeah, hello, I guess I'm out now. And it's so funny because when other people who have ADHD and you tell them that you've been diagnosed, their reaction is like, yay, congratulations. Oh, my God, that's so wonderful. Welcome to the club. And people yeah. who, who don't know anything about ADHD are just sort of look, have that look like, I'm sorry about your disorder. <laughs> I know. I, I thought that the other day. It was a bit like oh I'm sorry and I'm like what right <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> but no. I feel like the more we talk openly about it the more we're changing what it looks like so it's not like people immediately think oh she's a hot mess she's got ADHD I mean yes we all are in our own way hot messes but I think it's you know that ADHD also looks like very creative very capable very you know intelligent people who are doing wonderful things and and yes. you know just because I can't fold my laundry that who cares but <laughs> you know but we're really like I think these the the more of us the more we kind of live that truth, the more we're destigmatizing this stereotype yes. of like, oh, you can't possibly have ADHD because you're too, and then insert something positive. Like that's such a ridiculous stereotype uh, that it's like you're, think... too, you're too successful to have ADHD or you're too together. It's like, no, that's actually the, the two of those, are, they coexist. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I think um, knowing about it and, and, um, actually accepting the shadow side of it is is to to love it the whole thing you know understanding the weaknesses that come with it but then the, like all of the positives like I wouldn't take it away if someone said he's a pill I'd be like no right this is I'm 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 digging this <laughs> this is okay like <laughs> despite the downsides um it's you know it's the up, the creativity. Oh my God, the ideas, the business ideas. <laughs> right, absolutely. Uh, no, okay. So I'll yes. have a link to your website. But how uh, is there another way? Of, what's the best way that people can find you and well, look, look all you of up? My and... music, um, is everywhere. So um, just under my name, um, it. You'll, you'll see I'm ADHD with all the different styles of music when you get on there. Um, I've, I've got just a few of my albums on Spotify because they don't um, pay a lot. The rest of my albums are on my website. But um, And then if someone's interested in dopamine-fueled cleaning products like this, can I show it? I mean, yeah, this is on YouTube, so you can show it for the for the YouTube viewers. I'll, I'll just put a link to you. Them. Is there a separate website for the Abby's Alchemy? Um, there is, yeah. There's, okay, I'll make sure to I put a link for that. I, look, if someone wants something posted overseas, we can talk, but I don't normally sell overseas just because it's expensive. Yeah, well, but, um, you know, I've, yeah. I've got quite a Australia, New Zealand listenership growing so oh, right right <laughs> wow well the cleaning products are you know they're multi-sensory because the crystals make music and um and it's all natural and they're refillable so um that's 
and that my my little side love. Before I love I do that. These allergy t-shirts, but yeah. <laughs> Well, and yeah, also so, like you were talking about with the hypnotherapy, right? It was like your musical background was able to give you that unique perspective of the similarities. And I'm like, if we don't, we can't, if we yeah. don't have all of these crazy experiences and try all of these random things, we are, we're able to see those connections in ways that other people aren't. So, yeah, I think I'll get back into the hypnotherapy. Maybe when I'm an old lady, <laughs> um, I can, I can see it. I'll just be all crazy and woo woo and doing past life regression. Right? And... Caftan <laughs> and a bunch of crystals. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, well, I love it. Thank you so much, Abby. It's been absolutely delightful to so hear I your wish, story. I wish you were closer. I'd love, I'd say, come around for dinner. <laughs> Where are you? I'm in New York. Wow. Uh, not, I'm not in New York City. I'm in New York State. I'm just sort of in the in the suburbs outside of uh, oh. outside of the city. But yeah, um, oh, absolutely. Like someday I'll make go. it there. <laughs> Yay! Well, come. This is paradise. And it Byron oh. Bay is ten minutes from here, but Brunswick Heads is like the spot. It's oh. cool. yeah. All right. I'll definitely look you up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. Have a lovely day oh, and so a great lovely. weekend. Thank you. Bye.